verses from from Psalm 86 to begin our time of worship. I'm actually starting with verse 6 of Psalm 86. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. I'm sure there's lots of testimonies of us who have called upon the Lord in our time of need and have experienced uh, His help. It goes on to say this, Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. Father, I'm thankful for this time where we can come together on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, to worship you um, collectively like this. And so I pray that our worship would be found pleasing to you, Father, that through your Spirit we can worship you in spirit and in truth, and all for the glory of Christ. In his name I pray, amen.
angel told Mary, you shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Hebrews tells us that uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm grateful for that, that, that God is immutable. He does not change. We probably all have dealt with situations where, well, that's not what you had said, uh, where things have changed in, in a lot of times in an unfavorable way. But with God, we don't, we don't have to have that concern. God does not change. His word does not change. It's forever settled in heaven. Jesus Christ is the same. And his identity, he is the son of God. He is God. And our identity of who we are in him. We're a new creation, and we uh, are eternally the family of God through Christ. So thankful for that. I pray that you are as well. I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 or turn uh, to your phone app to Acts chapter 2. This is our second message from Acts 2, and uh, we will have a couple more messages. Uh, before we're done with this particular chapter. We started to, in Acts not long ago, and uh, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, if you will, the, uh, the first century church, it's, it's, it's exciting reading through Acts. I pray that you find it that way as well. Uh, last week, we, though we read down to verse 13, we only covered to verse 4. Uh, Today, we'll be looking at verses 5 through 21, and I intend to cover all of those verses. So, again, join me in looking at Acts chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 5, and we'll read down to verse 21. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because Everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Jewel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me read just part of 22. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God. I make mention of that since we're not going to get there today. I wanted to at least read that. Because four times in Jesus or in Peter's sermon, the first apostolic sermon, if you will, that took place on the day of Pentecost, the first of that of the of the early church. Uh, Peter mentions four times the name of Jesus. It's interesting. In the book of Acts, Jesus is mentioned over forty-five times. In the book of Acts, over fifty times the Holy Spirit is made reference to. 
So we see it. It's it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Acts is, is the Holy Spirit of God making big of Jesus Christ. That's what we find throughout the book of Acts. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for your, for your word, and thank you, again, as already mentioned, it's forever settled in heaven. Thank you for that. And thank you, Father, that your word is living. It's living. Your spirit, pneuma, uh, is what gives life to the word of God. He is life. And so, Spirit of God, I pray that you would take your word today and speak life. Speak life. Spirit, speak spiritual life today. Take people who are dead, spiritually speaking, and make them alive. Make them alive, we pray. And take others who are in a stupor, perhaps, and bring them out of that. Bring fresh in. Bring fresh fire into their lives. Now, Father, your word tells us that uh, we're not to grieve your spirit and forgive us for the times we have done that. We're not to quench your work, Holy Spirit. Forgive us for the times we have done that. So I would pray a fresh filling of the blessed spirit upon the children of God today for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray that. Amen. Uh, last week and the week before, I received um, updates from missionaries that we help support. If you look at the back of your bulletin, you'll see that Faith Bible Church has many missionaries that we support, as well as the bridge, many missionaries which we support. And uh, to me, that should be, or that is exciting, and I pray that you find that exciting, because here we are in Central PA, that we can have part of the work of God all over the globe, all over the globe. Uh, and so uh, I want to read a, uh, an email that was sent, uh, and I guess I'll leave the name of that missionary out for right now. But this is what he, he uh, sent in way of email to supporters of, of the ministry. He says, I just returned from one of the most impactful international trips of my entire life where I spent five days deep in the interior of India. There I witnessed firsthand the intense power of the gospel being released upon countless numbers of Hindus and animists who are experiencing a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In this situation, well, I'll stop there. He goes on to say this, when I looked into the faces of thousands of new believers, thousands, I saw an unquestionable passion for Jesus and a contagious excitement. All this transpired transpired following their firm commitment to Jesus as the only God, their Savior, and their personal experience of the indwelling Holy of the Holy Spirit, which was transforming their lives, their families, and their community. So that was from two weeks ago from one of the one of the missions that we support here at the bridge. They do work in China, they do work all over the world. But here's a report of how the Spirit of God is being poured out on people of India, changing the lives of of Hindus and many others in that area. And then this was a text I got from a a brother, from a missionary that we support who's been up here on this platform and shared the gospel with you. So is the other individual that I just mentioned from the other ministry. But he sent me a text. And it was a picture of himself and a Muslim, uh, actually a Muslim imam, which is a minister of, of, of the Muslim faith. And his picture was blackened out, of course, just for, for protection. And this Muslim came to saving knowledge of Christ. How did he come about to save the knowledge of Christ? The text says he came to Christ because Jesus appeared to him in a dream on several nights. Several nights. Since then, in coming to Christ, he has lost his wife, his children, his money, his vehicles, his material possessions. And they are actually trying to kill this man. They they tried to run him over in the streets. So he's actually in hiding now. And that's oftentimes what happens when people of other faiths come to Christ. Uh, 
He also went on to tell our missionary friend that we support that since coming to Christ himself, and now keep in mind, he wasn't only a Muslim, but he, or, or isn't only a Muslim, but he was a Muslim minister. Iman, I believe they, call, they pronounce it. Since then, he has led over 160 other people to Christ, and he tells our missionary friend that I have 20 men ready to be trained as pastors. So that, that's exciting news. You should find that exciting as a child of God. You see, the Holy Spirit of God that came down upon uh, the, those, that 120 on the day of Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit of God that continues to bring people to saving knowledge of Christ today. And not only does he bring people to saving knowledge of Christ, but he continues to fill and to enable and in, to empower the children of God today. I made mention in my prayer, and I didn't intend to, but I trust the Spirit of God's leading. And people say, why isn't that happening here? People say we need revival. There's revivals happening all over the world. Do we want it? Do we pray for it? I still think of that line in in, in Jeremy, one of Jeremy Camp's song, the same power that brought Jesus from the grave lives in us, lives in us. And so because he does live with us, live within us, we should be seeing revival in our lives and even in our area. And as I was praying about this, I thought, well, what happens? And those two words that I prayed earlier Spirit of God gets grieved, and the Spirit of God's working gets quenched. What does that mean? Like a wet blanket is thrown over the work of the Holy Spirit. And sin is, is the reason in both cases. Sin in our lives, and a lack of, of, of pursuing, a lack, a, a lack of desiring the Spirit of God, and also a resisting of his influence in our lives. How many times when we're in a situation, and, and, and we do, we, we sense the Spirit of God, and I say sense, and, and that's okay. We see at least two of the, of the 120 people that were there on the day of Pentecost, we see at least two of their senses being ministered to. They, they heard the sound. They saw the, the, the tongues of fire as it were. And, and, and they were they were changed. They were shaken. And so the Spirit of God does minister to our senses. And sin in our lives can cause us to grieve. Ephesians 4.30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So if you're wondering, where's that power? Where's that power? Where, where's revival? Where, where is the whole, why isn't the Holy Spirit of God working? Perhaps ask yourself and perhaps ask God. God, can I be guilty of, of, of grieving your spirit? Holy Spirit, have I grieved you by, by my sin, by my lack of pursuit for you? Someone once said that the, the, the fuel of the fire is the word of God, prayer, and obedience to the ordinances that God has given to us. If you don't feed the fire, it's going to go out. Sometimes the working of the Holy Spirit is grieved because of sin, and sometimes because we don't feed the work. In other words, we don't pursue God through His Word, through prayer, through praise, through thanksgiving. So Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Don't put that fire out. Don't put that light out. Don't put that ardent uh, heat, if you will, out. Don't, don't. And if you have, ask the Spirit of God to forgive you and ask the Spirit of God to, to blow, or blow across those, those, uh, smoldering embers of your of your of your faith to bring fresh fire well none of that was planned but here we are 
when we look at verse 5, and just quick review of verse 3 and 4 if we can. Uh, quick review. And there appeared to them divided tongues. So this is the day of Pentecost. I won't go into that long explanation of what the day of Pentecost. We know that it was 50 days after the Passover. And, and keep this in mind lest I forget to mention it. Many, many of the Jews from all over the known world at that time would come for the day of Passover, for the Feast of Passover. And then they would remain there for those 50 days. And this is what we got. We got multitudes of Jews from all over the place there and have been there since Passover. Okay? So that's a little bit of a setting. And so we know that uh, the, the 120 are up in the upper room and they're praying and praying and they're waiting. And their waiting was not in vain, and, and our waiting upon the Lord is not. Just remember that. And there appeared to them as they were praying, as they were in one accord, as they were there, uh, appeared to them di divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So, th so we see these emblems, if you will. We see, we see the Holy Spirit manifested in the form of sound uh, from that rushing wind, and, and also... Uh, they saw these things that looked like fire uh, landing upon each uh, of them there. And then we see the results of that. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and then what did the Holy Spirit move them to do then? Well, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we know from the original language of the word tongue here, and we'll also see it supported two more times, that, that they heard them in their own dialect, their own language. So that's just a little background. The promised Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you wait. The promise, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's what he promised them. And the Holy Spirit had come. And so, uh, there they are. And uh, this sound was heard all over. And then you have... This multitude of people speaking, and, and every, but every people group, not people group, the Jews from various uh, nations, various areas, were there, and they're all hearing the word of God. Let, let's look at by, verse 5 and 6. They're hearing in their own language. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men. I want to not hurry over that part. Again, I've already explained a little bit that many of those Jews that were dwelling there had been there for over 50 days. They'd come for the Feast of Passover, and many of them stayed. In fact, some scholars say that, that the Jews that were more well-off had homes there. Like people have a second home in Florida, snowbirds and stuff. Well, well their Jews would have homes there in Jerusalem, although they may have lived in they may have lived at that time in Mesopotamia, for instance. They still had a place that they kept in Jerusalem. They were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. Uh, who was it? Emperor Tiberius, before he came and started that uh, uh, encampment around Jerusalem. That was during the Feast of Passover Around that time, they claim that there were 3 million Jews there in Jerusalem at that time. So it just gives you an idea of possibly how many people were there. I also want you to understand when it says devout men, don't, don't overlook that. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. So these are Jews. They, they, that was their nationality. But because of being taken into captivity hundreds of years before, uh, because of the dispersion, Jews were spread out all over the place. But devout Jews would come to Jerusalem for the various feasts. And devout meaning that they feared God. That they were pious. That they were God-fearing, God-honoring, genuine, sincere worshipers of God. Devout men. From every nation under heaven, and though they were from every nation under heaven, these are still Jewish people. Okay. And so when the sound occurred, and notice it says sound, that's what they heard. That same <laughs> that fell on the day of Pentecost, they heard that. What was that? What was that? Well, then it wasn't long after that, they heard, what are we hearing? Do you hear that? I hear that. 
but they're hearing it in their own language. And when his sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused, <laughs> just, just utterly dumbfounded. How is it that I'm from here, you're from there, I speak this, you speak that, and yet we're all hearing these wonderful works of God. Many of the Psalms, I'm sure, were being uh, proclaimed, and, and they're hearing it. And they're hearing it in their what? They're hearing it in their own language. Go to a foreign country, and what? what and everybody's speaking a, a foreign language, and then what, what if... All of a sudden, you're hearing your own language. And you're hearing God being praised in that. Well, this is exactly what was taking place. They're hearing it in their own language. That phenomenon itself. It's a mighty working of God. The results of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That is what we're seeing. Verses 7 and 8 is not on the screen. Then they all were amazed. Yeah, I would think, wouldn't you? Try to take yourself there. Just try to take yourself there. The, the, the sound, the noise, then the language, each hearing in their own language. Wow, what is going on? What is going on? They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our, in our language in which we were born? And when we hear that word Galileans, uh, it'd be like, no, I better not say any little town around here because that wouldn't be very smart. <laughs> it was funny the other the other day. The other day could be months ago. You all, you all can relate to that, right? Anyhow, we were visiting, visiting the youngest daughter, helping her move once again. And uh, anyhow, friends that they had made since they moved to that state that invented the toothbrush, since they moved there, Anyhow, uh, uh, friends were over. Friends were over. And uh, my daughter introduced, and she says, Scott. She says, you say that a lot. Well, you know, what's your name? Scott. Scott. I didn't think I said it. Says, that's thick. Where are you from? From central Pennsylvania. I said, I suppose you say water, don't you? Yeah, it's water. Said, yeah, I thought so. But anyhow, uh, what is the point here? Well, they were uh, they were dumbfounded because most of the people that they heard speaking their own language were Galileans, and Galileans they were most of them weren't educated, most of them weren't sophisticated, most of them had a Thick accent, and yet they're hearing the wonderful works of God in their own language. We can't say perfect English, but they were hearing it in their perfect dialect. And so that in itself was an amazement to them. We read in uh, further on in Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So here's here's another account uh, where here's a couple of these Galileans and, and they're just scratching their head. How, how can these Galileans, these ex-fishermen, how, how can they be doing this? And again, it was testimony of, of the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in their lives. Now, some say that this reference of uh, that they were Galileans is just uh, for geographical purposes to let them know that this is the region they're from. But uh, other times, and, and this verse being supported, is most of the time they were looked down upon because of the area that they came from. They were not all that... Uh, articulate in their speech but by the spirit of god we see what he has done here and the gospel uh the gospel will be shared by peter but here we see them speaking the wonderful works of god and so they're all amazed at this and i won't read down through uh, verses 9 through 11 again 
uh, I think once was more than enough. Verse 12 says, so they were all amazed and perplexed. Can you imagine having this sanctuary, this auditorium, this room filled, all the seats filled? Can you imagine that would be great? But what if everybody in each chair was from a different nation, a different place? And yet, through the Spirit of God, the, the, the Word of God goes forth, and each one hears the wonderful works of God right in their own language. That's what took place that day. That's what took place. Now, there's a couple conclusions drawn. And when we look at verse 11, or, uh, 11 where it says, uh, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. That's what they were hearing. They were hearing them proclaim the wonderful works of God. And again, I believe many of the things they were hearing were from the Psalms. Uh, but from the Old Testament, the wonderful works of God. And that's important because the New Testament wouldn't have been written yet. Okay? And all they would have had would have been the Old Testament. And they would have had that in common. They would have had that in common. So the Old Testament is what these people were proclaiming uh, the wonderful works of God from. And so that's being received well. And, and this is not by half a chance. The Spirit of God is directing this ministry right now. So these Jews are hearing the wonderful works of God from the Old Testament, which is, if you will, setting the stage for now for Peter to stand up and proclaim Jesus. And that's what we see happening next. They were amazed, and they asked the question, whatever could this mean? <laughs> what is this? What in the world? It's God. And of course, there were some who drew the wrong conclusion. Ah, they're drunk. So if you think new wine doesn't have the capability of intoxicating a person, wrong. That's what they're accused of. Others mocking said they are full of new wine. And I like how Peter doesn't waste a whole lot of time on that. He just basically says, that's ridiculous. When you stop and think about it, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And all these people... Have had too much to drink already? No. That's nonsense. He doesn't waste any more time with that. Moves on. And again, we have to keep in mind, he's directed by the Holy Spirit of God. So really, in the first 13 verses here, we see, uh, the, we see uh, Luke giving us an account of what took place on the day of Pentecost. And we see now Peter giving an explanation of what had taken place. So let's look at verse 14. But Peter standing up with the 11. So, so, so from the 120, Peter stands up. The 11 stand up to the 11 apostles. And remember, Judas had been replaced by Matthias. And so here they are. So Peter's there with the 11 apostles. And he raised his voice, said to the men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem. And, and as far as dwelling in Jerusalem, that doesn't mean just the Jews who actually that was their that that was their place of residence, but all these Jews from all over that had come in for the feast. Let this be known to you and heed my words. Peter, who was never too backwards before in the past, right? Bold Peter, impetuous at times. Spitting out his sandal more than one occasion, I'm sure. But recently had denied Christ. Right? And so there's a little timidity going on there. However, of course, we read from John's gospel that, that Jesus took him to task over that. And, and, uh, and Peter was reinstated, if you will. He, he was able then to, uh, through Christ's loving words, uh, come to that place of... of being renewed, if you will, and, and, and over that, if you will, in a sense. In addition, we find a Peter standing up filled with the Holy Spirit of God. 
Peter's not speaking out of his own his own doing now. Oh, his own personality is there, and that's the neat thing about, if you will, about the transforming part of, of, of the Holy Spirit of God. When he brings the new life, we're we're still that person, right? We're just a better view of that, or a better uh, uh, person through it. But he uses our personalities. He uses our quirky things. He, the Spirit of God just uses us, but we know that the power is not ourselves the power is him working in us and there again it's very important that we seek god's face to say if you if you feel powerless if you feel like you don't have strength you don't have desire you don't uh, that living the christian life is hard then again we need to seek god and ask him father have i grieved the spirit have i quenched your work well peter is standing and he's bold and peter is standing and he's not backing down. And it's not in his own strength, but it's in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That he says, let this be known to you and heed my words. He has their attention. He has their attention. What on? To, what does he go on to say then? Well, we, he says, first of all, in verse 15, these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. First of all, let's just dismiss that. That's not very smart for you to even have said that. Then he moves on. He doesn't give three points of, of alcohol and uh, uh, the whole matter of wine and intoxicate. He, he, that's not the focus here. The focus is an explanation of what has just transpired. An explanation of the promised Holy Spirit coming to them. That's what he was standing to do. The Holy Spirit had been poured out and now Peter is sharing you know, Peter would go on to write, and again, inspired by the Holy Spirit, in 1 Peter 3.15, he, he says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And this is exactly the spirit that Peter is giving this, in a spirit of meekness and, and reverence, if you will. Let me re repeat that verse and would have been a good one to have on the PowerPoint. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. First of all, are we living lives? Are we living lives that have hope? That people can hear it, that people can see it? Are we letting our light shine, which has been the focus of the last two months of our memory verse? Are we letting our light shine to where somebody does notice? And someone even asks, hey, what is it with you, dude? What is it? And are we ready to give an explanation, a defense? So we are to live in such a way that Jesus is on display, if you will. That's how we're to live. Let our light shine. And then when somebody might ask you about it, well, then you, you go ahead and you take that open door, you take that green light, and you talk about it. That's what we're called to do. Here's Peter's debut, if you will. And uh, the Holy Spirit speaks powerfully through him. What could this answer, What could this be? Why? What is going on? What's the explanation? Well, after verse 15, it says, it, 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 no, they're not drunk. But here's exactly what, what you are seeing. This is exactly what you are experiencing. So let's look at verses 16 and 17 and from the ESV. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. I love how the Spirit of God takes the minister of God to the Word of God to boldly proclaim it. And, and that's what we see here. The people that the, the, the others were boldly proclaiming the wonderful works of God. But now here, Peter, directed by the Spirit of God, is proclaiming the Word of God. But it is what is uttered through the prophet Joel. You can read Joel in about ten minutes. How many? Yeah, there's three chapters. I've read it through twice this week, just to have more of a background of, of, of this prophet. And a little bit about 
the prophet Joel and what he was speaking. But first of all, let me read those two verses. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So hundreds of years prior, uh, the prophet Joel says this will take place. Okay? So what Peter is, is preaching, what he's proclaiming, is Old Testament prophecy that is being fulfilled. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And people in India will come flocking to Christ. And Muslims in that area of the Middle East and Egypt and northwestern uh, part of Africa they will have visions. They'll see Jesus again and again and again. Isn't that what we just read from the missionary's account? You see, the, the same Holy Spirit that, that uh, was, was giving Peter the words, if you will, and the, not only the utterance, but the empowerment to proclaim God's word from the prophet Joel, the same Holy Spirit, that Joel said would be poured out on the on all flesh, continues to be poured out on all flesh. The same spirit. The same spirit that brought Jesus from the grave lives in us, lives in us. We gotta let him work. We need to let him work. If we're his children, we're his vessels, we need to quit stifling his work. And I'm preaching to myself on it. This whole getting into the, to the Acts of the Apostle has challenged me more than I've been challenged in a long time as far as being a, a Christian and, and being follower of Christ, being a minister. Scott, let me work through you. And it's refreshing because we grow tired in our own strength, don't we? In fact, left to ourselves, we're really not going to do the work of God. We need the Spirit of God to work through us, and He wants to work through us. And Peter is telling us, that this that you see taking place today. I wonder how many I wonder how many feasts of the Passover and uh, feasts of the first fruits, how many days of Pentecost many of those Jews would have experienced before. But this is a day of Pentecost like never before. And not to be repeated as far as the day of Pentecost, but praise God ever since the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit has come down Every day the Spirit of God is being poured out and working through people's lives. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. So this isn't just the Jews. This is every people group that there are that the Spirit of God is being poured out. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men, young men shall see visions and your old men shall dreams i want to have visions that means i'm still a young man i don't want to have i don't want to have dreams that means i'm old then all right that was weak but so peter begins his sermon and this is a great example of how what i believe what sermons should entail and that is the word of god preached in the power and the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Peter began his, his sermon by quoting from Joel, from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament of that time. And we see where God had promised there would be a time when all who followed him would receive his spirit. And that this time has come to pass. This was the beginning of the last days. I hear so much of that. We're in the end times. We're in the end times. Friends, we've been in the end times in the last days since the day of Pentecost. Upon the, the coming of the blessed Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the Holy Spirit come, we 
entered in, if you will, into the messianic age, the last days. That's what we're in. And we are in the end times and have been in them. And the next thing, the next big event, if you will, is the return of Christ. The return of Christ. So on this particular day of Pentecost, Peter preached the first apostolic sermon. We find a few things. It was biblical in nature. Here is the first reference of Old Testament passage. In this message that we see of Peter speaking, there are three Old Testament passages that he brings out. He takes scripture and he makes application. And that's what we see him doing. I shared verse 22 with you because here we see Jesus, Peter then beginning to make big of Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit of God does. Where, where the Spirit of God dwells within, where the Spirit of God is not quenched, where it is not gre- where He is not, not yet, where He is not grieved, you will find people sharing about Jesus. When professing Christians aren't sharing about Jesus, it's because we're not allowing the Spirit of God to have His way in us, His way in us. What did, G, what did Peter preach? Well, we see him preaching the fulfillment of Joel. We also then, as this sermon goes on, and uh, we'll see that more next week, but he proclaimed the reality of Jesus' crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and now the promise of the Holy Spirit. John fifteen twenty six says, But when the Helper comes, meaning the Holy Spirit, when Helper comes, whom I shall send to you, Uh, From the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And that's why we do say that often around here, that the Holy Spirit will make big of Jesus. We talk about people who are in the back working, in the back. They don't like being out on the limelight. They don't like being on the front stage. They're behind the scenes working, right? Well, the Holy Spirit of God is always making big of Jesus, pushing him To the front. Why? Because it's through Jesus that we're saved. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone that we're saved. So Peter's message, he proclaimed the reality of Jesus' crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And now we see the Holy Spirit giving boldness to proclaim Jesus. He did, only, he did not only preach biblically and boldly, but I believe he preached in a fundamental, reasonable way. He, he started with the old, he, he considered his crowd, okay? And, and again, the Spirit of God doing all this, working, giving him direction. But he considered the crowd, and so, okay, these are Jews who know the Old Testament. We're going to the Old Testament. And so proving from the Word of God in a very fundamental, reasonable way, He proclaims what has taken place is the fulfillment of prophecy. And because this prophecy is fulfilled, now let me tell you about Jesus the Messiah. So it laid the groundwork. It was wise, but then if spirit led, it would be wise, wouldn't it? And so what Peter said was what... is what Joel had prophesied would happen in the last days, that God promised that he would pour out his spirit on all flesh, and that prophecy from long ago is what you're witnessing. That's what Peter was basically telling them. And we won't go into all the nuts and bolts of it, but we see that it says on all flesh. Keep that in mind. All flesh. Not just Jews. That's what we find here in this setting. But the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all, on all who by faith respond to the gracious call and come to Christ, turn from their sins and, and, and come to him. But the spirit would be poured out, your sons, your daughters. And I, I, and I love the, what it says there. Look at this in verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, God will pour out my, my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Your young men uh, shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. And look at verse 18, and I think we have 18. Yeah, we have it both on there. And then now the next, even on my male servants and my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Did you notice that nobody was left out? 
but they were left out. No people group. So regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of status, regardless of age, you see that? All, all flesh. In those last two verses that we looked at, all flesh. Young, old, male, female, servant. Non-servant. All flesh. None exempt. And we see throughout Acts where those prophecies being fulfilled. Where Philip's daughters prophesy. And uh, Agabus prophesies. And we, we know that C- Stephen... That young Stephen, as he's being martyred, he sees a vision. Paul saw a vision. Uh, John on the Isle of Patmos, and a dream in which we find uh, revelation. All flesh. And I want you to take notice then of verse 21. And so not all of the prophecy was fulfilled on that day. Not all the prophecy that Joel mentioned was fulfilled that day. In fact, when you look at verse 19 and 20 that aren't on there, I will show wonders in heaven above. I believe that had already started. And signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness. One pointed out that at Jesus' crucifixion, you know, the sun turned dark a few hours later. I believe some of these are yet to be fulfilled. And we see the next event in verse 20, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Well, his coming in as far as the sense of the Holy Spirit coming. But as far as his return, that is yet future. The return of Christ is yet future. In verse 21, it's on the screen, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That holds true to today. And so for application, have you called upon the name of the Lord? And in Peter speaking this from Jewel the prophet, he is now speaking of the sovereignty of Christ. He is saying that this Christ is the Lord, the sovereign God. And it shall come to pass, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And not just rescued and delivered from calamity of this life, but rescued, delivered from sin and the penalty of it. And so have you, personally, the salvation is personal. Your mom can't do it for you. Your grandma can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. I had a lot of good Christian relatives. Sorry, that doesn't cut it. You ought to be thankful that you did. But what about you? God's word says that it shall come and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, crying out to him for forgiveness, crying out to him for salvation. It's interesting that, uh, and so in just looking at this last point, the Holy Spirit's ministering then and now, it's interesting that Paul, again, guided by the same Holy Spirit, used this portion of Joel's prophecy uh, in his letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 10, and we'll have verses 12 and 13 on the screen for you. But we see this, this being mentioned once again. And this time not by Peter, but by Paul. And so here's what he says. Uh, if we can have verse 12, 13. And here again, I want you to see about the Holy Spirit uh, being poured out on all flesh. All flesh meaning all flesh, all people groups. Because it says, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. There, there's just none. Oh, there are Jews and there are Greeks. But the same Holy Spirit who, who came on the day of Pentecost continues to call people from all over the globe. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who what? Call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He used that same same passage. Have you called upon the Lord? In 
until Jesus returns, there is time to call upon the name of the Lord. Some people want to buy time. It doesn't work that way. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Calling today. Calling today. Don't put them off. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, let me wrap it up with this verse. And again, just just uh, emphasizing the the point that 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 the Spirit of God uh, is being poured out currently, continually, and that all who call upon Him will be saved. Let, let's look at Galatians chapter three. This came to mind in studying. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And that's the only way we become the children of God is through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, and they were baptized in Christ through the Holy Spirit of God when we were immersed by the Spirit of God, birthed into the family of God. And those who were in that time, as we spent a little bit of time talking about this before, that in the early church, when someone came to saving knowledge of Christ, they were then baptized. Water baptism as a symbol of their faith in Christ, as a as a uh, identity with Christ. For as many of you were baptized into Christ Jesus that put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. Are there all those things yet? Yes. Yeah, this isn't doing away with the different ethnic groups. This isn't doing away with gender. This isn't doing away with various statuses. Paul's just saying when it comes to Christ, we're all equal. When it comes to the Holy Spirit ministering to us, we're all equal. There's no distinction. You are all one in Christ Jesus question is, are you in Christ Jesus? Are you in Christ Jesus? Are you sure of that? When you're not feeling it, can, can you still go back in your mind and, say, and, and turn to the Word of God and say, no, no, I, I know it's true. There was a time in my life up to this point, but then at this point, I recall crying out to God for forgiveness and and, and trusting in Christ as my Savior. And according to the Word of God, I am now a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Is that truth in your life? That you've experienced that time? Because let me tell you, there will be lots of days you won't feel anything and you'll wonder. And you're, and the Spirit of God will take you back. But yes, remember this. Remember this day. And you may not remember what day it was. You, you may not remember a lot of the particulars. I can still remember kneeling down. On a bedroom floor as a late teen, crying out to God for forgiveness. And to bring a release. We're still a work in progress after we come to Christ. But there's a day when we can. We don't just eventually just sort of just you know, go along and, and now you're there. No, no. No. Now there's, there's, a, there, there's a time when you go from being dead to being made alive spiritually. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you know our hearts and you know for those standing here or sitting here, those who are viewing this or who will view it, you you know whether or not we have responded to your gracious call that we just didn't uh, evolve into. Now I'm a Christian, but know that there was a time when we, by faith, responded to you and we have experience forgiveness we've experienced new life so father for those of us who have i would pray holy spirit of god yes please fill us fresh for the work 
in the ministry that you've given us to do in all of us. Since your spirit has been poured out on all flesh, we all have something to do. We're all called to be witnesses. And Father, for those who may be here and those who may view, be viewing, God, if, 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 if they have not come to Christ, may today be the day where they, by faith, see their sins, that they see that reality that they're sinners without Christ, and they hear your gracious call to come, and they turn, and they trust, and they continue with them. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, we praise you that we have that hope. We can sing hallelujah, meaning praise the Lord. 
because we have a hope not just in this life, uh, but for the life to come. So thank you for that living hope. And Father, as recipients of your grace, of your forgiveness, recipients of salvation being rescued and delivered, help us to be proclaimers of that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.